Lesson 12 Deuteronomy in the New Testament Sabbath Afternoon December 11 It was the privilege of the Jewish people to understand these prophecies and to recognize their fulfillment in the mission of Jesus. Christ urged upon his disciples the importance of prophetic study. Referring to the prophecy given to Daniel in regard to their time, he said, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. After his resurrection, he explained to the disciples in all the prophets the things concerning himself. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. The Savior had spoken through all the prophets. The Spirit of Christ which was in them testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. The Desire of Ages, page 234. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the Word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for the supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience, how in every act of life he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives, and how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. The Old Testament sheds light upon the new and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ, Christ as manifested to the patriarchs, as symbolized in the sacrificial service, as portrayed in the law, and as revealed by the prophets, is the riches of the Old Testament. Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, Christ as he is manifested by the Holy Spirit, is the treasure of the new. Both old and new present truths that will continually reveal new depths of meaning to the earnest seeker. Lift him up. Page 115. Men of ability have devoted a lifetime of study and prayer to the searching of the scriptures, and yet there are many portions of the Bible that have not been fully explored. Some passages of scripture will never be perfectly comprehended until in the future life Christ shall explain them. There are mysteries to be unraveled, statements that human minds cannot harmonize, and the enemy will seek to arouse argument upon these points which might better remain undiscussed. A devoted spiritual worker will avoid bringing up minor theoretical differences and will devote his energies to the proclamation of the great testing truths to be given to the world. He will point the people to the work of redemption, the commandments of God, the near coming of Christ, and it will be found that in these subjects there is food enough for thought. Gospel Workers, page 313. Sunday, December 12. It is written. In meeting the enemy in the wilderness, Christ's response to his wicked insinuations was, It is written. When Satan presumed to claim the ownership of the whole world and asked Christ to worship him as God, he who with a word might have called to his assistance legions of angels merely said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10 The intensity of this conflict we but partly understand. It seemed as though the Savior would die on the field of battle, but he withstood the wily foe. His words, so carefully chosen, were as sharp as a two-edged sword. Satan was thoroughly repulsed. He realized that the Prince of Life could not be deceived by any sophistry. Let the Word of God be our study. To as many as believe in him, Christ gives power to become the sons of God, 
as they follow on to know the truth, their feet are planted on the sure foundation. Neither flood nor storm can sweep away their foundation. Letter 289, September 13, 1905 To My Brethren in the Ministry In the warfare, the enemy takes advantage of the weakest points in the defense of those he is attacking. Here he makes his fiercest assaults. The Christian should have no weak points in his defense. He should be barricaded by the support that the scriptures give to the one who is doing God's will. The tempted soul will bear away the victory if he follows the example of him who met the tempter with the word, It is written. He can stand securely in the protection of a thus saith the Lord. This Day with God, page 295. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me, and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up, as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. Your hope is not in yourself, it is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength, your ignorance to his wisdom, your frailty to his enduring might. So you are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but look to Christ. Let the mind dwell upon his love, upon the beauty, the perfection of his character. Steps to Christ, page 70. Monday, December 13. Lifting Up Faces No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple courts that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's influence those who have been deluded by his deceptions and places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. Prophets and Kings, page 369. Never are we to be cold and unsympathetic, especially when dealing with the poor. Courtesy, sympathy, and compassion are to be shown to all. Partiality for the wealthy is displeasing to God. Jesus is slighted when his needy children are slighted. They are not rich in this world's goods, but they are dear to his heart of love. God recognizes no distinction of rank. With him, there is no caste. In his sight, Men are simply men, good or bad. In the day of final reckoning, position, rank, or wealth will not alter by a hair's breadth the case of anyone. By the all-seeing God, men will be judged by what they are in purity, in nobility, in love for Christ. Christ declared that the gospel is to be preached to the poor. Never does God's truth put on an aspect of greater loveliness than when brought to the needy and destitute. Then it is that the light of the gospel shines forth in its most radiant clearness, lighting up the hut of the peasant and the rude cottage of the laborer. Angels of God are there, and their presence makes the crust of bread and the cup of water a banquet. Those who have been neglected and abandoned by the world are raised to be sons and daughters of the Most High. Lifted above any position that earth can give, they sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. They may have no earthly treasure, 
but they have found the pearl of great price. Councils on Stewardship, page 162. That which Satan plants in the heart, envy, jealousy, evil surmising, evil speaking, impatience, prejudice, selfishness, covetousness, and vanity, must be uprooted. If these evil things are allowed to remain in the soul, they will bear fruit by which many shall be defiled. Oh, how many cultivate the poisonous plants that kill out the precious fruits of love and defile the soul. Love's agencies have wonderful power, for they are divine. The soft answer that turneth away wrath, the love that suffereth long and is kind, the charity that covereth a multitude of sins. Would we learn the lesson with what power for healing would our lives be gifted? How life would be transformed and the earth become a very likeness and foretaste of heaven. My Life Today, page 179. Tuesday, December 14. Cursed on a Tree. We have transgressed the law of God and by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. The best efforts that man in his own strength can make are valueless to meet the holy and just law that he has transgressed. But through faith in Christ, he may claim the righteousness of the Son of God as all-sufficient. Christ satisfied the demands of the law in his human nature. He bore the curse of the law for the sinner, made an atonement for him, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Genuine faith appropriates the righteousness of Christ, and the sinner is made an overcomer with Christ. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. Man cannot be saved without obedience, but his work should not be of himself. Christ should work in him to will and to do of his good pleasure. When we seek to gain heaven through the merits of Christ, the soul makes progress. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we may go on from strength to strength, from victory to victory, for through Christ, the grace of God has worked out our complete salvation. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 363 and 364. That he might sanctify the people with his own blood, Christ suffered without the gate. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. For transgression of the law of God, Adam and Eve were banished from Eden. Christ, our substitute, was to suffer without the boundaries of Jerusalem. He died outside the gate where felons and murderers were executed. Full of significance are the words, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. God suffered his wrath against transgression to fall on his beloved son. Jesus was to be crucified for the sins of men. What suffering then would the sinner bear who continued in sin? All the impenitent and unbelieving would know a sorrow and misery that language would fail to express. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now... With the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt.
The Desire of Ages, pages 741, 743, and 753. Wednesday, December 15. A Prophet Like Unto Thee In the closing events of the Crucifixion Day, fresh evidence was given of the fulfillment of prophecy and new witness borne to Christ's divinity. When the darkness had lifted from the cross and the Savior's dying cry had been uttered, immediately another voice was heard saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. These words were said in no whispered tones. All eyes were turned to see whence they came. Who had spoken? It was the centurion, the Roman soldier. The divine patience of the Savior and his sudden death, with the cry of victory upon his lips, had impressed this heathen. In the bruised, broken body hanging upon the cross, the centurion recognized the form of the Son of God. He could not refrain from confessing his faith. Thus again, evidence was given that our Redeemer was to see of the travail of his soul. Upon the very day of his death, three men, differing widely from one another, had declared their faith. He who commanded the Roman guard, he who bore the cross of the Savior, and he who died upon the cross at his side. The Desire of Ages, page 770. God requires moral perfection in all. Those who have been given light and opportunities should, as God's stewards, aim for perfection and never, never lower the standard of righteousness to accommodate inherited and cultivated tendencies to wrong. Christ took upon him our human nature and lived our life to show us that we may be like him by partaking of the divine nature. We may be holy as Christ was holy in human nature. Why then are there so many disagreeable characters in the world? It is because they do not suspect that their disagreeable ways and rough, impolite speech is the result of an unholy heart. It is the fragrance of our love to our fellow men that reveals our love for God. It is patience and service that brings rest to the soul. It is through humble, diligent, faithful toilers that the welfare of Israel is promoted. God upholds and strengthens the one who is willing to learn Christ's way. This Day with God, page 32. While the claims of the law of God are to be presented to the world, we should never forget that love, the love of Christ, is the only power that can soften the heart and lead to obedience. All the great truths of the scriptures center in Christ. Rightly understood, all lead to Him. Let Christ be presented as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of the great plan of redemption. Present to the people such subjects as will strengthen their confidence in God and in His Word and lead them to investigate its teachings for themselves. And, as they go forward, step by step, in the study of the Bible, they will be better prepared to appreciate the beauty and harmony of its precious truths. Evangelism, pages 484 and 485. Thursday, December 16. A Fearful Thing It will not be long until the gathering storm will burst upon the world that is so asleep in sin. When the earth is reeling to and fro like a drunkard, when the heavens are shaking and the great day of the Lord has come, who shall be able to stand? That Lamb whose wrath will be so terrible to the scorners of His grace will be grace and righteousness and love and blessing to all who have received Him. The pillar of cloud that was dark with terror and avenging wrath to the Egyptians was to the people of God a pillar of fire for brightness. So will it be to the Lord's people in these last days. The light and glory of God to His commandment-keeping people are darkness to the unbelieving. They see that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
the arm long stretched, strong to save all who come unto him, is strong to execute his judgment upon all who would not come unto him, that they might have life. The sure provision has been made to shelter every soul and shield those who have kept his commandments until the indignation be overpassed. That I may know him, page 356. It is our privilege to go to Jesus and be cleansed and to stand before the law without shame or remorse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Henceforth you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. Through this simple act of believing God, the Holy Spirit has begotten a new life in your heart. You are as a child born into the family of God, and He loves you as He loves His Son. Steps to Christ, pages 51 and 52. If sinners can be led to give one earnest look at the cross, if they can obtain a full view of the crucified Savior, they will realize the depth of God's compassion and the sinfulness of sin. When at the foot of the cross the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. As you read the promises, Remember they are the expression of unutterable love and pity. Yes, only believe that God is your helper. He wants to restore his moral image in man. As you draw near to him with confession and repentance, he will draw near to you with mercy and forgiveness. The Faith I Live By, page 103. For further reading, Sons and Daughters of God, He Knows How to Help Us When We Are Tempted, page 24, and Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, This is Justification by Faith, volume 6, page 1070.